welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today we're talking about esports intellectual property law. With me is my fellow attorney, Kimberly Culp. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, Catherine. It's good to be here. It's great to have you here. And Kimberly and I met uh, when we did an, when we taught a webinar. Actually, I flew to Wisconsin and she had to do hers remotely. I think my section was about four I and a half hours. From, so, yeah, COVID ruined my, my trip, but you just squeaked in under the wire. Absolutely, just barely. Um, that is a very memorable experience. Well, Kimberly, I understand you practice esports law as well and you focus in with intellectual property. That's right. I'm an intellectual property and advertising lawyer, which essentially means I work with players, teams, um, a lot of uh, studios in particular on their intellectual property issues. So that's patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and advertising issues, which is really what you tell the world about your product or your service. Okay. Why don't you tell us what a copyright is? Yeah, so a copyright is uh, essentially an idea that's been reduced um, to a, a tangible medium that um, has originality. Think of um, Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse uh, on a movie is uh, copyrightable. Um, the idea of a mouse that is animated is not itself uh, copyrightable because you have to put it down in a medium, Mickey Mouse. Uh, movies and then um, from there it turns into uh, Mickey Mouse on toys and the other things but all of that um, reduced to the um, the medium of the, the movie or the toy uh, becomes a copyrightable um, expression. Okay and a trademark what, what is that? Yeah so trademarks are something that um, most folks are uh, really familiar with but it's your brand. Um, it's the thing that people see where they say, aha, that's a company. You know, so we were talking before we went live about Coca-Cola, very famous trademark. Uh, you think about you know, the Coca-Cola script, uh, that is a trademark. You can also have a related idea to a trademark is trade dress. And trade dress is the look and the feel that also tells you that that's a particular product. You know, so again, think about Coca-Cola, the red and the white and the particular design around that. So trademarks and trade dress um, are concepts that you see a lot of in video games. In esports, trademarks are really important um, because you're really often thinking about uh, team names, player tag names, things of that nature are trademarkable and become the thing that a player is known by or a team is known by. Okay, and on your screen, you see the Think Tech Hawaii trademark, right? So That's right. Okay, so let's get right into some questions. Um, is there any one intellectual property issue that esports teams need to understand above all others? So the teams need to understand who owns um, who owns the copyright to the game, right? So the the, the studios that uh, develop the video game own the copyright to the game. Who has rights to use the video game? depends on the license that's in the game, which is um, these days most often uh, terms of service. Um, when you think about digital games, you're downloading your game onto a PlayStation, you're downloading your game onto a phone, you're downloading your game um, through Steam, something like that. But um, the terms of service around the game, what can you do with it? Teams need to understand who owns the copyright because it defines what they can do with the game or what they can't do with the game. Because at the end of the day, the publishers do control those rights and what rights they do or do not give out, they do so by contract. How do they find out about who owns the copyright? Do they need to read some, something? Yeah, I mean, so the assumption is, um, and the assumption should be, the publisher owns the copyright. Um, so you can certainly, if you wanted to get into the weeds to find out who owns the copyright, you can do a search. Um, you can certainly read the terms. The terms will tell you who owns the copyright. But from the team's perspective, the assumption should be the publisher owns the copyright. There may be contractual agreements behind the scenes that you don't know about um, as to who owns what rights around the copyright. But from the 
player team perspective, assume the publisher owns the copyright. Okay, so if someone wants to host a tournament, do they need to get the publisher's approval in advance? You know, so from a lawyer's perspective, yes, you do. Um, now, there are permissions that are given oftentimes in the terms as to what you can and cannot do in terms of tournaments. Um, a high school that was doing a nonprofit uh, fundraiser, for example, um, is probably not in risky territory, uh, even if the terms don't say um, that you have permission to run such an event. But on the flip side, if um, a, uh, an event promoter was going to have a, a large tournament at a stadium, I live in the Bay Area. So, you know, think um, Chase Stadium in San Francisco where the Warriors play. Um, and Chase Stadium and the promoters there were going to do this enormous tournament playing a video game that is owned by copyright without permission of the game publisher and sell tickets and stream it and everything like that, there will be problems. Okay. One of the things I think about when I think about copyrights is enforcement of copyrights. And one of the most famous um, companies or entities that enforces their copyrights is uh, the Olympic Games, and they're very strict at enforcement. Uh, when you say that uh, perhaps a charity event, they don't have to worry so much about it, is that because they would there would let, be a less likelihood of enforcement in that situation, or what are you? Why would you say that? So that's. Um... Great question. And uh, March Madness uh, on the trademark side is another one that is very, very uh, heavy in terms of the enforcement work. You know, so informal March Madness events, uh, particularly in March, uh, often see enforcement action. Uh, you know, the reason why I would say that I, the idea of doing a nonprofit, again, my example was a high school fundraiser is less risky is to some extent the games benefit sometimes benefit greatly from the exposure uh, and the goodwill that's created by teams of fans getting together being excited getting their friends in um, taking you know Instagram posts and Snapchat and putting it all out on social media about how wonderful the game is and how much fun they had and they raised money for charity that's a lot of fabulous press for a, a game studio and they might be willing to say you know what that fits within our terms close enough we're okay with that um, the incentive to shut something down from a business perspective creeps up as the uh, infringement on the rights at, that the game studio might have and might want to exercise so if the studio wants to do a tournament at chase stadium themselves and chase is doing their own that's very different from, than a studio that says, we weren't ever going to do a big sale esports game anyway, so we're okay with it. Sure. Okay. And when I say enforcement, I am talking about litigation. Is that what you infer from my use of that word? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just for everyone who's not a litigator, Catherine, I know um, your upbringing is as a litigator by this too. Um, enforcement takes many flavors. It ends in litigation, which is a lawsuit it often starts with a letter or an email that is um, what we call a cease and desist letter. And it says, stop, you have done the following things. We have these rights and we are asking you or we are demanding that you stop. And then it escalates from there. And so if you were to get a cease and desist order and you felt that the company would benefit from that use of their copyright or their trademark, um, then would you explain that in an effort to try to get them to back down? Yeah, so it depends on who my client is. If my client is the promoter, let's say, the high school, and they received a cease and desist letter from a publisher, um, the strategy would be to try and find a way to work it out. Um, and maybe there would be a subsequent event that's approved and the profits from that go back to the publisher, but there'd be a, a, an effort to find a workaround. If my client was the publisher, we would be talking about things like risk to the brand. What does this look like if you go after a high school, for instance? Um, and how does that impact on what, you're, what else you're doing in the esports space if you're being litigious right here, litigious being threatening a lawsuit? 
And so the, the dynamics are different depending upon who your client is. And you're both talking about the law and the business issues associated with the legal issues. Sure. And I would think that a company should have a, a vision of what they want a company culture so that they would look at those kind of things so that where it was a high school or something that is consistent with their culture or their vision for their brand that perhaps they wouldn't do that. Is that correct? Yeah. And this is by no means a rubber stamp to the high school um, administrators and teams that are listening, thinking about we're, we're going to do this. You know, it might be mm -hmm. worthwhile to um, think about which games and what do the terms of service for those games say about rights? Do I have more rights with this game than I do with that game? Because they've been um, uh, more permissive in drafting the, the, the term. So I would think about it. I would just be worried about the issue if it was our hypothetical of the, um, the fundraiser versus our hypothetical of the for-profit event at a large public stadium. Okay. And I'm sure that we'll have... Um streamers, um, you know, those who stream esports and, um, and others um, that will be watching, who has the rights to stream league games online? So um, we're back to copyright, right? The publisher owns the copyright. The, uh, the terms oftentimes permit some amount of streaming without monetary benefit associated with it. So if a streamer isn't um, say streaming on um, a channel that is you, you've got to pay 10 bucks to sign in and see their stream personally and they're sort of generating that revenue putting aside the ad revenue that one might get on a platform for the streaming service um, it's generally as long as you're not monetizing it in that way the terms will permit permit the streamer to do that an interesting um, IP issue and I'm not aware of any resolution in the law on this issue you may be Catherine is whether or not a, a particular style of play is itself a copyright such that the streamer can claim that the way they play a video game um, and the way they editorialize and all of that is itself a performance that um, for, for our listeners gives them a defense. The defense being I've created a new, a new copyright by streaming the game in a particular way uh, and um, I'm not aware of any litigation that's answered that question, but I am aware that from the streamer's perspective, that's a theory that's been tossed out there as a defense for streamers if they butt up against a publisher that says you're not allowed to stream on game. Sure, and esports um, popularity is fairly new in our society, so we don't have a lot of case law or even statutory law that addresses a lot of these issues. So a lot of it is coming up with theories and arguments that may or may not work well. So what about players? Do they have a right to stream themselves playing a game? So, um, you yeah, know, it comes, it comes back to the terms and it comes back to the question about whether or not their performance is essentially a derivative copyright under U.S. law or, you know, some similar laws in other countries. Um, the answer right now is, for all intents and purposes, publishers are allowing it. They're allowing it in their terms, and they're, they're, they're generally allowing it. And that does seem to be the better uh, answer from a copyright perspective. Um, again, so long as the streamer's not doing it in a way that it becomes uh, uh, an infringing act uh, beyond just, I'm on YouTube, I'm commentating about how I play, I get some ad revenue in the background, but really I'm just running a YouTube channel. Our, our pay for service uh, uh, situation might be different. It might be viewed differently by a publisher. Sure. So now looking at things like skins, are competitors allowed to bring their own elements such as skins into tournament play? It depends on the tournament. Um, and, it, and to some extent it overlaps as well with um, the relationship between the skin and the promoters at a tournament. So there may be agreements between um, those who are promoting the tournament and the tournament organizers that say that players can't use specific skins. So let's take our Coca-Cola example. Let's assume Coca-Cola is a large promoter of a tournament. Uh, their agreement with the tournament organizer might say no other soda um, 
you know, company, and we're really talking Pepsi, right, can, um, you know, have any of their material displayed. Well, let's say someone has a skin that, you know, is a, you know, giant Pepsi symbol, that might not be permitted. And so those issues come in, you know, you need the tournament organizer would have to think about its agreements with its promoters. Um, and then some, some tournaments may take the, a hardline position uh, that you can't bring anything into the game. And the reason being, obviously, cheats, bots, uh, anything that can give an unfair advantage. Some tournaments say you must use our keyboard, our mouse, our everything. Mm-hmm. So there's no question about fairness. So depending upon how those rules are set up, it might prohibit someone from bringing in a skin because it's just a hard line rule. We control the, the entire environment. You show up in your jersey and you sit down and play versus here, here, here's, here's lines you can cross and here's lines you can't cross. Sure. And that brings to mind where in television, uh, various television shows or even races where there are sponsors, and that would include the Olympics, um, play, the sponsors, um, you know, there are many sponsors and you can't, like, let's just say that you um, are sponsored by Nike. And like, say you're Tiger Woods and you're sponsored by Nike and you wear, you're going to wear your Nike hat, your Nike shirt. But if you wore an Adidas hat or something, you'd either have to replace it with a Nike hat or you'd have to black out the the logo. So I would expect that with esports um, televised events that, you know, there are situations where uh, something you wear, some gear, some logo has to be blacked out because it is a competitor of a sponsor or it wouldn't properly be there. That's right. And if you're any tournament organizers that are listening, um, you know, certainly that's something you should expect to see if you're, you know, negotiating an agreement with someone who's going to sponsor the tournament. Someone might want to say, we own the hardware space. So everything that is hardware related, we will supply it and you will only advertise us. There can't be anyone else who's doing monitors, keyboards, mice, uh, maybe cables, the, the, whole, the whole thing. We own that space, even if perhaps their main product is keyboards. It's not all of those other things. They, they might still insist they own the hardware space. And if you want their dollars, that's, that's what they're buying the right to. And it's a negotiation, but um, certainly that is an ask to be expected. Sure. And in all of these, it's negotiation, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's right. So is there one intellectual property issue that esports players need to understand above all others? Yeah, trademarks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so we go back to our example of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is a trademark, um, but let's sort of bring it into sports. Um, FaZe Clan, they have done a really good job of trademarking the um the brand for the team and enforcing their trademark they have litigated uh the trademark phase uh in california they've um, had some litigation over apparel uh, where there's a company in san francisco that had phase on their clothing and phase clan had their own clothing and they they you know in, went to went to litigation over the issue um Players, just like teams, can have trademarks. And the trademark you're thinking of is your player tag. Um, you know, so Ninja. Uh, player tags are something that players should be thinking about getting a trademark around um, because the persona of the player becomes something that has value long beyond being part of an esport team, being in a particular tournament. There are a number of players already, even as nascent as esports are, that have decided they'll make more money if they stream and stop competing in tournaments. And what they're taking with them is this persona that they've created, this fan base that they've created, and part of the intellectual property that the player creates for themselves is around their player tag, who they are identified to in, in the community. Sure. And and that player tag might have been developed when they're quite young too, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, yep. and, and that might be something that that they thought little of in protecting until they became a professional player. That's right. And um, there are things in intellectual property law where you have to move 
uh, quickly, patents in order to to secure the right to the intellectual property. Trademarks is not one of those insofar as you have a common law trademark. So you can develop the right to the trademark through without a registration. So if you're that, that young player who's now matured a bit and it matters about a trademark, you know, don't fear that it's too late. It's not too late. Um, the time is to talk to an attorney who can help you with your trademarks and see whether or not the player tag you chose long ago when you weren't thinking about it is one that no one else has taken. And assuming it you know, is one that hasn't been taken, whether or not you can secure a trademark to it now, a registered trademark. Have you seen much um, litigation or um, you know, uh, conflict involving players that have the same tag? I haven't. Um, I haven't. You know, you can certainly think of, uh, we now have uh, famous players, right, who have mm -hmm. famous player tags. So you could see, you know, one of those players bringing an enforcement action if someone, you know, coming up through the ranks happened to have the same player tag. Um, but I haven't seen any examples of individuals doing that. And it might be because the essence of the player tag itself is to be unique. And so there's some, um, you know, harmony insofar as people are trying to use it as a unique name um, more than they're trying to confuse others that they're this other player. Uh, because that's the, that's the essence there, you know, with companies. If someone wants you to think you're buying a Coca-Cola, even though you're not really buying a Coca-Cola, um, that's not the incentive here. The incentive for the players is I am this person and you want right. everybody to know it. Right. There has to be an intent, right? Or something similar. Um, so what is a right of publicity? Yeah, so the right of publicity com is a common law right, and um, it's different in every state. And, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of litigation around right of publicity in California, and there's a lot in New York. And the laws in California and New York, just by way of example, are different. I've seen cases come out of New York that I think would have gone differently had they been litigated in California. So it's important, one, um, to ask this question of your lawyer in the state you're in, for starters, and then start thinking beyond, beyond the state. But essentially, it comes from the right of privacy that we have in our, um, that, that comes to us from our individual states. And the idea being that the public can't interfere, that another person can't interfere with our right of publicity, our right essentially to make money off of ourselves and, and our identity. And so your image, your voice, your likeness. Um, so in the video game space, we've seen litigation over avatars that look very similar to pictures that have been taken of real people. The question being whether that avatar infringes the right of publicity of that real person. But essentially, it's your right to monetize who you are. Now that right, as I said, differs a little bit depending upon which state you, you're looking at when you come to the point of saying, aha, uh -huh, you have infringed my right of publicity. Okay, now let's move to sponsors. What should sponsors keep in mind in relation to their advertising activities at eSports events? Um, you know, so sponsors should be thinking about what they're getting and what they're giving. You know, so we had that example of a sponsor who, you know, wants to own the particular space uh, at the tournament. You know, so that's one consideration. Um, you know, another consideration is what are you giving? Are you giving sort of in-kind services or in-kind products? Or are you giving cash? And what's the, what's the exchange? What are you trying to get out of it? Um, when, it when are you going to be promoted? Um, you know, what's the reach of the tournament in particular? Is it reaching your right audience? Because um, the sponsor's really coming back to, am I getting a good business deal? You know, for the sponsor, it's advertising. You know, I am promoting my product. Usually it's a product, but it could be a service. I am promoting my product to potential buyers of my product. So the question is, am I getting good value for my money? Um, even if your money is supplying all of the keyboards or supplying all of the mice or supplying all of the jerseys, um, or it could just be money. Sure, sure. And what issues should brands think about when working with players on social media advertising? Yeah, so um, uh, 
players um, are probably most familiar with the idea of the disclosures that are required by the Federal Trade Commission. And the disclosures are, and we've seen them um, in the social media advertising space a lot, hashtag ad. It's not fun, it's not sexy, but um, brands need to be thinking, am I contracting with a player who's going to follow the rules and disclose that we have a relationship that is of a material kind? And so a material relationship can be you've gotten free access to a game two weeks before everybody else. If that's the case, the player that's streaming the game two weeks early should be disclosing that that relationship exists. Certainly if you've paid the player, uh, the player must disclose the relationship. So brands should be thinking about, am I getting into a relationship with somebody who's going to play by the rules? Because the FTC can go after the brand just as much as the player for violating schools. Sure. Okay. And one last question before we wrap it up. Are there any IP issues that a player should consider if they're planning to retire from tournament play? And for example, if um, they're, um, they earn their income primarily through social media and streaming? So they should be thinking about their trademarks. They should be thinking about their right of publicity. They should be thinking about um, whether they've given any of those rights away perhaps in the contracts that they have with um, their team, and they should understand what rights they have going forward. They should have an attorney, frankly, review their contract so they know what they can and cannot do in the future. All right. Well, it's been wonderful having you here today, Kimberly. It's been fun. It's been and, fun. All right. And uh, next week we will um, have uh, Sergeant Jones with the U.S. Army eSports team, and I look forward to seeing you then. See you next time. Aloha.